Welcome to another episode of Beta Talk. I'm with my usual guest host, Ken Bones, Bonesy as we call him. I'm with Brandon. Hello. And I'm also with another one of our friends, uh, another engineer uh, who's not been on the podcast before, and that's uh, Bill Johnson. And I'm hosted by Kenza. Now, Kenza are very well known in this industry for ground source, heat pumps. Um, so I came to visit them today along with my engineers and very, very impressed. We're all very impressed. We've, we've all known about uh, Kenza. Um, set up, I think, uh, by a guy called Guy, who's their technical director. Kind of ri- reminds me of my grandfather, actually, because my grandfather was a technical director who set up sort of some of the oil uh, burner companies in this country. And uh, you can tell instantly when you walk into Kenza, there's a nice atmosphere. They know what they're talking about. And... One of the things they're talking about is heat pumps. So I'm going to introduce you to Darren Veal. Now, Darren, what is your role at Kenza? Um, yeah, so my role is technical support, um, commissioning and training here at Kenza. How long have you been with them? Uh, six years now. Enjoying it? Yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. What's what changed in them six years? Oh, massive changes we've seen. Yeah, um, I, think, I think the industry's changed a lot. Um, in as much as I think it took a long time for us to get the message out there. I think we're still trying to get the message out there and trying to make uh, heat pumps more mainstream. I think training's changed a lot. Um, MCS, oil prices, you know, there's there's a lot of things that have had knock-on effects to us being able to sell a heat pump. Now, I mentioned your technical director, Guy. Now, I've not actually met Guy personally, but I've seen him on some YouTube videos uh, uh, which I really like watching. He comes across as very technical and very down to earth. So, how did he start this company up? Yeah, so Guy um, and his partner Richard Freeborn uh, were business partners, and they first built their first heat pump in a garage, in their own garage. Um, it was predominantly used for heating, not for hot water. I don't think they could get the temperatures back then. Um, the cylinders weren't available. Um, and yeah, I think that was used, and then it went on from there basically. It was one after that that was built for another friend and then slowly they were like this is this really works this is you know they knew the technology um they were both marine um bio not biologists marine engineers um, engineers thanks same as my grandfather was yeah yeah absolutely and and just with their knowledge they've slowly evolved that heat pump into a better quality heat pump um and looking at different refrigerant types as we're aware we can get achieve better temperatures so then hot water was suddenly brought into it, and that was a big thing, really, stepping up from just being heating only to being able to provide heating and hot water. All of a sudden, you've got a solution for a house. What I'm going to do, I'm sort of very aware of my audience, and some of the audience we've got are, um, are kind of people that will probably be thinking about buying a ground source heat pump. And so in a moment, we'll sort of talk about how a ground source heat pump works. Um, one of the things I want to also talk to Kenza about, and some of my engineers are very keen on this, is something called district and community heating. Bill, I'm going to bring you in on this one. What is district and community heating? It's basically where you you spread the the heat from a central source around the different buildings where it's needed. It could be a (coughs) communal building where you've got blocks of flats or it could be individual houses, but they're all linked up using a system of pipes bringing heat or energy into the building. Now, the interesting thing about Kenza's method is that instead of using heated water, preheated water from a boiler, they're just bringing the ambient temperature water into the individual property. So I'm going to, we'll discuss exactly how a ground source heat pump uh, works. Now I'm going to bring Brandon in. It's just a fridge, isn't it? It's a <laughs> so I think, I think some of our listeners will want to understand there's a difference between the brine that's circulating around under mm-hmm. your ground or in a borehole, and then where does that go? Okay, so any form of heat pump, we need a source of heat that we start with. Now, we've discussed air sources previously, and in that instance, we take the heat out of the ambient temperature in the air. The difference with a ground source is we'd be taking that, as the name suggests, from the ground. Now, normally, that would be through a closed pipe system that's underground, either vertically in a borehole or laying horizontally underground. So we pass uh, what we call brine. It's normally actually a glycol solution. Brine, to me, coming from a marine background, is salt water. But we pass what we call the brine through that system. It heats up, 
typically four to five degrees. And then we use that as our feed heat in order to put through the fridge cycle, which then gives us our secondary heat that we can put out into the heating system or the hot water or wherever we require heat. So it's, it's worth mentioning to the listener that that wall drawer, Brian, does not mix with our refrigerant in um, the exchange. No, it? classically, we use a pair of plates. And you use, is it, in yours? Absolutely. Yeah. Your plates. A pair of plate heat exchangers. So it's, it's also worth mentioning, so that, that Brian's quite important uh, to get right, isn't it? So when you guys out there doing this sort of stuff, you measure and test this, Brian, don't you? Yeah, for many things. So um, we, one, test it to make sure it's not just all going furry and full of bacteria, which can happen, because unfortunately the glycol is a great food stock for bacteria. So we test that this stuff isn't going to freeze, because when it gets very cold, it doesn't work very well. When it turns into ice, it's slightly harder to pump. So we test the um, glycol level in it to make sure it's protected. Capacity. Capacity, yeah, that also affects the amount of glycol we put in, affects the heat capacity of it, specific heat capacity. Unfortunately, the more glycol we put in, the less we have, the less heat capacity we have. Um, and then we, yeah, we test it. Where are we up to? So we've done biocide to make sure there's nothing growing in it, and we've made sure that it's not going to freeze in our pipes. We also, I think we'll probably get onto that later. I think I'll pass that over to your man here, to Darren. Is we have to make sure we have enough capacity in the ground that actually we can draw enough heat out without freezing around the ground. Because obviously, as we're drawing heat out, then it's going to cool that area. Now, soil doesn't flow like air or water so we have to make sure that we certainly have enough capacity that we can extract enough kilowatts out of it without freezing it and and how do you go about doing that down so you've obviously got some sort of uh, calculation process yeah a lot of it is built into our quote builder so we don't actually do that on an individual basis per project um the you know the computer system does that but it draws in um from various websites geological sites so what mm. we're looking at is the types of ground that we're going into um, the thermal conductivity of that ground and initially we're always going to start with a property and say look how much energy does that property need and then we'll look at the ground available and calculate how much we need to allow that heat pump to run to deliver that temperature into the property and um, Brandon's quite right in what he said um, but what what we would do is you've got to think about the recovery time a heat pump will run and it will get to the room temperature. But what you're actually doing while you're running your heat pump is actually lowering your ground temperature. Mm. We need to make sure that ground can recover that t- temperature when the heat pump switched off. And how do you go about that then? Is that just making sure you've got the, the area? Yeah, I think for, um, I mean, as a typical example, if you had, say, a 250 square meter house um, and you're looking at a new build, something like uh, 40 watts per meter squared is new build regs we would typically say that needs 10 kilowatts of energy, just as a rough, a rough guide. Um, and then we would look at, historically, we know a 50-meter slinky will generally give you about 5 kilowatts. Now, that 5 kilowatts needs to be taken from a 50-meter trench um, spaced at 5-meter center. So it needs 5 meters of ground to recover that energy from. Okay, so we could look at that quite simply and say you need two 50-meter slinkies. You might need more energy from the ground if you're then going to run a cylinder for two hours a day. Okay, so it could be that there's slightly more. Now, I was driving in with Bill uh, this morning, and Bill, we were talking about the geology of this country because it's quite uh, quite unique, aren't we, uh, this Extremely country? Extremely varied. The UK has probably got... Well, the British Isles are probably the most complex geology in the world. <clears throat> Britain has formed from basically three continents that collided hundreds of millions of years ago. And so we've got different geologies in different parts of the country, depending on where those continents originated. Some of it originated in the South Pole. Some of it originated on the other side, on the west and the east. It's extremely old. So we've got a variety of very old rocks, like granite. Uh, Then you've got the sedimentary rock, like uh, limestone and sandstone. And then you've got the clays, which are the, basically the residue of all of these different stones that have been ground away by uh, the, uh, the, um, the glaciers during the, the, last, well, the last few ice ages and are just common erosion. <coughs> now we've, we're down to the, 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 the bedrock <clears throat> in a lot of places, covered over with uh, hundreds of metres of clay in some cases. Add to the mix, you've had all the seismic activity of the collision of the uh, the continents, which happened over a long period of time, and we're talking geological terms, so you're talking hundreds of millions of years. 
every time there's a, a, a slip in the landscape, it creates heat, so it changes the, the nature of the rocks underneath. And we're having to deal with all of that. So it is a little complicated, so it's probably why we have some of the best drillers in the world, and also best mining engineers, uh, like in Cornwall, where they've had to mine through some of the most difficult rocks there are to extract the minerals. So we have a lot of knowledge in the UK of the, the, the nature of the ground, which is a great benefit to us. So for me, is, um, listening to that, I'm not a ge- geology expert, but if we have got this really good base of knowledge, it kind of makes sense that we use that knowledge and, and we really push ground source heat pumps, doesn't it? I mean, we all know that we're kind of up against the boiler industry. And um, we've talked earlier about how we've got high rise blocks of flats that have got gas boilers in and having gas boilers replaced. We can actually use heat pumps in these blocks of flats, can't we, Dan? We can, we, yeah, you've absolutely. got a system for it. We, we call it the the shoe box, I think we called it. Yeah, it's the, sh- it's the shoe box. That's what he yeah, told yeah, me the it was called. <laughs> Um, it was designed specifically to go in a kitchen cupboard or in an airing cupboard. Um, we do two sizes of unit, three kilowatt and six kilowatt. Um, the six kilowatt is actually a twin. Uh, they can both achieve 65 degree hot water and um, will sit comfortably underneath a cylinder in an airing cupboard. Now, what we find with district systems, a lot of the time there's not the, the vast amount of ground that comes with a block of flats. Usually there's a car park and a, a bit of a footpath around the block of flats. Um, so typically what we do there is what we call boreholes, um, where we drill down uh, to around about 100, 150 metres uh, per borehole, um, link them all together, bring them back to a manifold, and then bring maybe two, maybe three or four pairs of um, header pipes back up through a riser cupboard in the flats. And then they literally feed each heat pump within each flat. So each customer essentially could just pay their own bill, their own electricity bill. We've got a cold array rather than having a central plant producing heat elsewhere and then losing heat on the way to the, f- to the building or to the flat. Um, we've got a cold array that picks heat up all the way into that heat pump, gaining energy rather than losing energy. Yeah, this was really interesting to me because I saw this so-called shoebox on the side and it really isn't very big at all i mean you say it fits in a kitchen cupboard it would fit in half a kitchen cupboard wouldn't it it doesn't Absolutely. take up the whole yeah, height single, it's not like an under counter fridge cupboard. it's tiny yeah. and um i presumed when he said i oh, we use them in flats i presumed it was an hiu so hint- heat interface unit that actually they'd have a big external plant and they were putting heat up and then taking it off and just putting it through a plate into the flat but no it is a tutti i mean it really is tutti i don't know if that's the word yeah it's the size it's just small. over the size of a, a, an average microwave Mm. Yeah, that's a good, yeah. Type, good way of explaining it. Four tappings coming out the top. It's just a microwave with a screen on the front rather than a door. And, uh, Could and, uh, be rather confusing if you've had a few too many beers. And unlike gas boilers, as we know, I mean, there's, there's lots of components you sort of fit uh, ancillary to a gas boiler. I mean, it might, not that many people do, but it might need an external expansion vessel. It'll need a deaeration device. It'll need a, uh, they do need a magnetic filter, but we, as we know, magnetic filters aren't the, uh, yeah, what the industry no, thinks no, no, they no. are. Um, but, but whereas this just literally is a box, so it's a space-saving thing. Now, I speak at something called Low Carbon Homes, where I speak to local authorities who are obviously in charge of these big sort of buildings. I mean, this makes a sort of perfect solution, what they're looking for to meet their zero carbon targets, doesn't it? or net zero carbon targets. Yeah, absolutely. It hits um, all, the, all the sweet spots, if you like. Um, from a funding point of view, I think there's still some eco-funding available. Um, I think what, you, what we look at is fuel poverty because a lot of the time you're looking at you know some of the tenants they can't necessarily afford to run um, the existing systems and it's really important that they can actually use a system that they can afford to turn on and feel comfortable with and I think a ground source offers that. Have you worked with many local authorities Kenza? Yeah, yeah, all across, right the way across the country. So, so they're We're actually engaging working with and, and understanding the technology then? Absolutely. Well, that's good news, yeah. then, isn't it? So um, a- as an engineer, and the engineers I've got in this room have sort of worked around this sort of stuff, how, let's say you're a, a gas engineer and you're getting excited about this sort of technology, sort of what advice do you sort of give them to sort of how to get into it? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I've seen, um, especially in the last six years, as we talked earlier about the changes, I think I've seen more and more gas installers coming to us, um, looking to get into the market, working out how the be- what and what the best route is. 
and a lot of the time uh, they just don't know where to go. There isn't enough places for them. Um, now, if they're very basic and they're just almost sort of basic plumbers, then we'd, we'd advise those guys to look on the website, get their knowledge up to scratch a little bit, um, and then come and see us. Yeah, yeah. M- make an appointment, come and see us. Um, we offer free bespoke training to those guys. You know, <clears throat> I could be sitting in front of architects, consultants, all sorts of various engineers, or it could just be, you know, a guy that knows how to fit a bathroom suite. But we're finding more and more people are learning slowly about heat pumps. Um, and we need to, you know, Kenza see it, the future has been training as big a part of that company growth as anything else. It's the biggest part of development. You know, you, you teach one guy to, to fit a heat pump and he's away. You know? I mean, Brandon and I and, and Ken, and, and we, we often talk about the training. And uh, something we're going to be working on very soon is making some sort of nice YouTube videos, which will help anyone that sort of wants to go into um, in, into the training, uh, which will just help them sort of, to sort of start to get an overview. I want to uh, bring Bill back in, because Bill, you've got a background in um, power stations, haven't I? Now, is, is that right? most things, actually. So, because obviously one of the things people question with heat pumps is uh, the grid. Can the grid cope and stuff like that? We see this all the time on, 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 on our social media sites. Now, you, you like I say, you've worked in power stations, haven't yeah. you? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your thoughts about that. I think the uh, to begin with the decarbonation, decarbonizing of the, uh, the the national grid generally, and the changes that are coming in with the um, the changing emphasis on the distri- district uh, distribution network operators, the people who run the wires, they're changing to be a a dis- distribution service operator, which changes the way they can go about business. So instead of <clears throat> generating all the electricity in a central um, power station, a large central power station, and distributing it around the country, there's more opportunity for generating it locally and then distributing it around the small networks. That then means that we can concentrate on where the electricity is needed. But by just the decarbonization of the electricity grid, now we, electricity is lower carbon than, than gas when you're burning gas. So the old policy of burning, of, of in, uh, encouraging gas boilers to be re- to replace electric heaters, it now doesn't make sense. A heat pump running on electricity gives you that boost. So even if it's carb- just straight off the grid with a carbon content of, say, 250, it does vary, so I'm using 250 as an average. 250 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour which is around about the same, similar to a gas boiler, then you divide that by at least three with the heat pump because that's the leverage that you get. Now, in all the years that I've been working on heat pumps, probably since 2006, we've been increasing the number of heat pumps that are on the grid. And yet the national grid consumption has dropped in that time. We're now using less electricity overall. So without going into any detailed numbers, despite the number of heat pumps that there are actually working out there, we've reduced our electricity consumption. That says to me there's still capacity. There's plenty of capacity. The problem the industry has, I think, is they don't understand the volumes. They're assuming that every house that's got a 25 or 30 kilowatt boiler in is going to need 25 or 30 kilowatts of electrical energy going in. That's not the, not the case. Boilers are usually three times, four times bigger than they actually need to be for the heating. And then the heat pump only uses a quarter, a third to a quarter of the energy that's coming out in heat. So I think the industry has not got its ideas right. They're thinking that they're going to have to replace gas in its entirety. And that's not the case at all. The amount of electricity that's going to be needed to, to drive all these heat pumps is a lot less than people are perceiving. But then, with a good heat pump and a good system, you can build in energy storage. Because a, a 250-litre cylinder will actually hold more energy than a, a Tesla wall uh, battery mm. for a fraction of the cost. Mm. And you're going to need one anyway. So if you can regulate the time that the heat pump runs, so stop it running at the peak times, 
and allow it to run at the uh, the off-peak times or when there's a glut of renewable electricity on the grid, sun shining and the winds blowing, for instance, then there's there's plenty of uh, scope to incorporate heat pumps with a minimal uh, disruption to the system that we've got. I, I want to validate what Bill's just said there. I mean, we we get asked all the time about can the grid cope with EV and heat pumps and stuff, and, and Bill's right in what he's saying that we are actually using less energy or electrical energy than we were about 15, 20 years ago with the same uh, infrastructure. Yes, okay, you might get um, a, you know a very thin leg of of um, the the network um, in 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 localized areas. So you do have to be careful. And what people are now starting to think about is actually um, small villages or even small small streets are starting to think collectively and maybe doing very localized. Um, energy production, whether it be a turbine battery linked into a, you know, a solar a solar farm, and also the smart grid is also going to come along. So instead of overloading the grid at certain times of the day, um, what we're going to try and do, or what's happening with appliances, any any household appliances, including heat pumps, um, they are actually going to be connected to the grid and they will be told at certain times and points of the day, especially around the sort of five o'clock, six o'clock, when everybody comes home and starts cooking and put their dinner on and having cups of tea, certain appliances will be um, told to back off their energy consumption. And what that does, you do that nationally, um, and what that does, it's, it, it's trying to balance out the grid so they don't actually need to fire up another power station to cover you cooking your dinner. So we've got all these technologies that are coming together, but certainly local community um, efforts are now um, talking and engaging with, with policymakers, as, as we've done on the podcast the other day. And they're now thinking to not always rely on the national grid, but perhaps do, a, do it a bit more locally. I want to um, I want to pick up this point about the, the shoebox uh, that, that, you, that you manufacture down and try and get across to consumers uh, that listen to this program the difference between that and a heat interface unit what is the difference um i think with the shoebox what we're doing as i was speaking earlier um is with the cold array coming up through the riser and coming to the heat pump i think that where there's no central plant we've not got any heat losses so like i said earlier it's just heat gain and the shoebox, because a 3 and a 6 kilowatt unit sized correctly for the flat, like I said, the customer is going to get their own bill. There's no need for metering. It's a simple standalone system um, connected to a ground array that doesn't need any servicing that you might need with um, heat interface units. There's no heat loss. The metering, there's, there's a lot of benefits. Um, it's far simpler. Mm, mm. It's just a lot simpler. And I think blocks of flats have an issue with cooling as well. And suddenly running a lot of cold ground array pipes up risers gives an opportunity to use some of that cooling as well. Because as, as, as we all know, the refrigeration cycle seems to confuse. It, it's, it's confusing if you're not used to it because it's this whole mindset of temperature means heat and so I think it's, it's worth mentioning to sort of some of these uh, um, listeners how this cold water that's coming up the riser is actually what's got, it's got energy in it that goes to these shoe boxes and then that energy gets transformed into very, very usable heat. Bill, how would you describe that different to heat interface units? How would you describe it? Uh, thermal heat, thermal interface unit <coughs> takes the heat from a combustion source normally, uh, generally circulated at high temperatures, and then usually aimed for about 80 degrees, because this is what the heating industry is used to. Then they work, they have probably a 15 to 20 degrees temperature difference between their flow and return. So we've got 80 degrees coming out of the boiler, and maybe 50 going back in, or 55, because you've got to take into account the losses from the pipe work. By the time it gets to the property, you're probably looking at about 70 degrees, because you've lost temperature through the ground, now, that represents energy 
that's just lost. So you've got to oversize the boiler to begin with because you won't be able to deliver what you're actually um, generating. So you're going to lose a lot. Then um, the the pipe work is going to deteriorate because it's working at a higher temperature. The heat interface unit itself is uh, a couple of uh, as a heat exchanger between the the water that's being circulated and the water that's going around your central heating and what's heating your hot water. But often it's got to be much bigger than it needs to be because they'll heat the water your domestic hot water that what's coming out of the tap is heated as it's being used so you've got to deliver quite a high amount of heat for that the shoebox concept is taking the a smaller amount of heat but over a longer period of time to heat the hot water store it in a cylinder that way you don't have to have such a a, such big pipes you don't have the, the same losses because as Darren said, you've got gains. The pipe worker is gaining heat, not losing it. So as an advantage, the, uh, the, by storing the, the energy in your cylinder, you can heat it up over an hour, say, even if you're going to use it over a matter of minutes. So you have a small device which is running on your own domestic power supply, which is not very much. Um, you can probably plug one of these into a, a, th- a, a just ordinary three-pin socket. That's the sort of scale we're talking about. It's uh, it's very small in terms of um, uh, energy use. In, in in reality, when you look at a lot of people with uh, flats, they're using um, uh, storage heaters. Often during the day, they've run out of heat, so they have to run a uh, a fan heater to supplement it. A fan heater may be one or two kilowatts of uh, of draw on the on the grid uh, because there's nothing left in in there. Um, so actually, they end up using more peak load than you do with a heat pump. But going back to what we were talking about, which was the um, using an uh, heat interface unit with the uh, with a combustion source. You've got two pieces of plant. You've got a you know, your interface unit in the flat, and you've got a complicated and um, a div- unreliable device that's and they're burning expensive. fuel. And they have service costs involved. And, Maintenance and, and, costs and. are very high on uh, this the central plant, whereas with a, a ground loop in the ground, maintenance costs are very low. It's very simple. You've got to keep a check on the quality of the fluid that's being pumped through there to make sure it doesn't get any con- contamination but that's a fairly straightforward check that can be done on a regular basis and it basically looks after itself each individual unit in the uh, in each apartment is it's probably as reliable as a domestic fridge because that's basically what's in it which lasts quite a long time doesn't it? and another thing of course with a, a traditional dom- um district heating system as you say you're typically running at 80 degrees out of the plant room and that's in order to give us that fantastic hot water response is the fact that that is kept like that 365 days a year right through the summer because it needs to be maintained because people still want a hot shower whereas the beauty of these i mean it, they've really blown my mind these little shoe boxes i'm already thinking of a job in town i was approached by a guy yesterday just <laughs> bought the nat west bank and um yeah he's just built 17 flats beside me and anyway i'm going to speak with steve later so if you're listening steve i would have had this conversation with you and um but yeah, the fact that actually, if that flat's not occupied, there's no need to produce any heat in it. Or if actually somebody wants it at a lower temperature. You know, we all know the horror stories of the old Soviet systems where you had two foot diameter pipes that were coming along. When they got to the end of the road, they just flowed out into the stream. And that was that vast amount of energy being sent down. The, the efficiency gains just strike me as absolutely wonderful. The other thing is you mentioned you don't get heat loss. You also mentioned the cooling in flats, Darren. And of course, if we haven't got dirty, great big hot risers coming through the building, we're not overheating our communal spaces or our our lift shafts or you know those it's just absolutely. a win-win yeah it's, yeah it's just an it's a scalable win-win. it's a natural scalable solution how long um, how long has this technology been have a, you got a, any i can put in my van on the way in <laughs> <laughs> how long has this technology been around and why haven't we, we been using it since the 50s? um i think yeah i think it's been around for 35 40 years um i think kenza have developed that shoe box primarily for that reason for the flats and for that district system um, and we've been plugging away at that very slowly. 
um, and have grown organically purely by getting our first. I don't know whether you remember you spoke to David Brim earlier, and um, one of the first projects was just a few small flats in a tiny village in Mid Devon. Why, they, they why are we still putting gas boilers in these in these high rise flats? Nathan, come on. The boiler industry is a I very do powerful lobby. Sue <laughs> <laughs> so was right to me yeah. to say it. Going back to Kenza then, Sue, so, so as a company, how are you getting that message out there? So, we, so Ken and I were talking to a, a, a lovely gentleman the other day called Richard who's involved in policy. And we know, we, we learned a little bit from him how policy works. It's, it involves lobbying groups. Um, how, how are you... I mean, I know Bean, and you know Bean um, from the Ground Source Heat Pump Association. How, how are organisations like that getting this message out there? Um, I think really through our website. Um, I think marketing do a great job of trying to highlight these schemes. Um, initially, it was getting that first scheme. And once, you know, it's like the snowball effect. Once you've got one, other people start to look at that, see the data from it, see the results, see the benefits. Um, and a lot of it is just word of mouth. And we just have been continually almost talking on about this for the last sort of 10 years, really. Um, and finally seeing fruition, it's come to fruition. And it's it's incredible the amount of people that now want to be a part of Kenza and love the concept. And slowly, they very slowly understood. And sometimes you have meetings with people and you sit down and you go through all this and you think all of a sudden you see the penny drop and then it's just an absolute game changer. I mean, just going back to um, heat interface units and central plant, if you think that, you know, the maintenance costs and all the rest of it, but also imagine this, if that breaks down, that central plant, you could have a tower block out of, everyone's got no hot water, no heating, you'd have a riot on your hands. You know, if a, a Kenza shoebox breaks down, if it breaks down, there's four valves on there, you turn them off, you unplug it, and you swap it over. It's that simple. You know, there's one customer that's going to be unhappy for a very short amount of time. I think that's a major benefit for Kenza Heat Pumps, having that small domestic unit that they can fully control and be in charge of their own their own bill and their own usage is a, a massive, massive bonus and uh, advantage for anyone wanting to run their own system. Building developers, I mean, obviously we, people talk about new builds. Have, have you got them uh, getting interested in this technology? Are you finding? Absolutely. I think the way the certain counties have gone that you cannot fit a gas boiler into a new build is a, is a game changer for us. Um, on the heat pump side of it, selling uh, just domestic heat pumps, we've seen the influx in new builds. It's, it's a no-brainer. They've got a digger on site. They, they've got a bit of ground. They've got a plot. They're going to put something in anyway. You can budget that into the price of your new build, and it's it's a fantastic system. You've right, Brandon, we, we've just talked about new builds, and obviously this, this the, the date 2025 has sort of been branded on it used everyone's... used to be the future, didn't it? That, now it's only just around the corner. Do you, you know, think <laughs> the gas boiler industry will be allowed to put hydrogen-ready boilers in to do oh, What are you asking me for? I don't do gas. In 2025. Um, I, I kind of watched the whole uh, hydrogen debate, and... Um, yeah, part of me despairs and part of me just really enjoys the comedy of it, if I'm honest. I I think it's a bit of a red herring, personally. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that the infrastructure is there for it. I know some people disagree. It's a distraction. I, yeah, that, that's how I see it, a bit of a distraction. I understand, you know, they've got Audis to drive and stuff like that. They need to keep selling gas boilers. Um, you know, why wouldn't they? Everyone has their own opinion on what they want to put in. It's. I can see that it might have some use in certain circumstances, should you put it that way, but I'm... I'm not entirely convinced. First of all, I'm not entirely convinced they're going to do anything in 2025 because um, that's like governmental and they can make stuff. And, you know, I'm not entirely sure. Was it just this morning or yesterday, Boris Johnson said we're not driving, well, no, no new diesel cars and petrol cars or hybrids after 35. It might happen, but... I can remember when we were going to be, uh, all houses were going to be uh, zero carbon by 2016. Yeah, there you go. We're all going to be riding hoverboards by the year 2000. Yep. Really disappointed about that. But um, I mean, I'm old enough to have a license and everything now. I can, and remember, I I can remember when uh, when I was uh, 13 and we were only 30 years away from having nuclear fusion. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're still only 30 years away from nuclear fusion 50 years later. Yeah. I'm going to bring in Nuke because Bill and I uh, were chatting about Nuke. Obviously, um, electricity is generated somehow. 
and we've got nuclear power stations and we've got gas turbines and I think we've got still six coal um, power stations. Just explain, I, I, I'm not for nuclear, you're not for nuclear, Bill, have I got that No, right? and I understand the, the concept, I've worked in the nuclear industry, um, but from my point of view, the it is such a dirty concept. We're creating something that had deteriorated and vanished from the planet uh, billions of years ago. And here we go, digging up the remnants of it, giving it a shake, and getting it going again. This is a, this is a product that existed before any life on Earth. And it's, it's the total antithesis of, of everything. Is it a little bit like we should leave a sleeping dog? Absolutely. It's in the ground. Leave it. Forget it. It's, it's, it is, we should not be playing with it. It is a, it's, the res, it's the waste of a dead planet. And if we're not careful, that's what we're going to create is another dead planet. I mean, th- those who are for it, and I'm, I'm not particularly, it has to be said. Of course, their argument is it's low carbon. My argument is the amount of housing we have to give it for the next grillion years and the amount we have to look after it and this, that, and the other. I mean, really, no. That's I mean, the reason I brought the topic the up is car- because obviously you've got people that like the idea of electric heat. They like this idea of us engineers discussing about um, It's a marketable heat pumps. product. That's and, then, why. and then obviously we, we, too we, cheap to meter. we create that electricity. <laughs> so th- there's some people out there that like nuclear power stations. I, I just don't like them. I and as, as we know, it's, um, you know, you, I think we use carbon as the um, catalytic or catalyst, I suppose. What do the French use? They use something else, don't they? Uh, seawater. They use uh, they use a, a water moderator. So they they process the water, uh, which then um, they they process it to it so it's high in deuterium. I think. Or deut- deut- Excuse me if I don't get One the word right. D, I think, something beginning with D. It's it's a kind of hydrogen isotope. Uh, we use carbon in, in our old uh, gas-cooled reactors, which works very well. Uh, it's very stable, and it's, we're able to refuel the reactors under load. So our reactors are very reliable. They produce a lot of electricity constantly. The French concept is um, simpler and cheaper to build, uh, but you can you you have to fill it up with the fuel and let it run until it runs out, and then break into it, uh, and then refuel it. So it's, it runs out of fuel gradually, so the power, consum- power that is given off reduces. And that's what we're going to, because it's cheaper. But you've got to start with the fuel. Where does the fuel come from? They are removing mountains in certain parts of the world, in the, usually the third world, Africa and India, uh, where they, they, they'll take a mountain complete whole mountain and reprocess it into a few kilograms of uh, uranium that is fissile that can actually be used the amount of damage that's done to the the environment just getting the fuel to and begin they're trying with to produce i suppose the end product is plutonium isn't it is that right the, that right well what started the industry going was wet weapons grade plutonium because that it comes out of nuclear reactors We've got so much weapons-grade plutonium now, we don't need to produce it. But they, they quite like the energy that it gives off, and it's basically a big steam engine which generates the electricity with the turbines. But it is a multi-trillion pound industry, and they don't let go of things very easily. To a lot of people, and to politicians, they see it as convenient because it's something that they could turn off if need be, so it gives people power, a central a uh, central source of energy which everybody relies on, we're all dependent on it then. I think the concept of distributed energy is a bit worrying for a government because... I'm waiting for someone to pull the plug. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Literally and metaphorically, aren't they? But with distributed mm-hmm. energy, it's, um, it's more democratic. Mm-hmm. You can't just pull the plug and stop everybody because uh, everybody's got a say in it. Isn't so, it is it Sellafield C they're currently building, is it? Hinkley Point C. It's about is it 50 the most miles expensive from here. structure on Earth. Probably to be now. And you it's likely to be. There are there are two things that you don't know about a nuclear power station. One is how long it's going to take to build, and the other is how much it's going to cost to build. Yeah. The other uh, there is we a built third quite one. quickly back in the day. <laughs> There's a third one. You don't oh, know how much well. it's going to cost to decommission. Well, I have a friend who started his career as a plumber. And he started his career decommissioning one of our plants in Wales. 
and he retired before they'd finished. So, which is pretty well, good going. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Started as an apprentice, taking pipes out. One, one of the questions people retired. ask is they, they get the idea of heat pumps or they really like the idea of heat pumps and they often then say, well, where's all this electricity? If, if we all went to heat pumps, where's all this electricity go for, uh, come from? So is, is that something we need to worry Comes about? the plug, doesn't it? Britain is one of the most has most of the one of the highest um, uh, wind not resources. wind speeds wind resources that's it yes thanks Brandon you're welcome the highest wind resources in Europe and we're only just tapping into it they've stopped building uh, wind on on land because because it reduces the price of houses and it um, it spoils the view from um, your estate. Lots of people have complained about it. Yeah, and it, it spoils the view from the, the golf course, so that's a bad thing. So we'll build them out at sea where it's much more expensive. And the cables have got to come in through the, all, all across the shore, which then the, the Crown Estate can then say all sorts of things here, aren't I? No, you carry on. You're welcome. <laughs> you carry on, the old man. So, so, so the point being, we, we, we can produce this electricity, yeah, can't we? There are, there are more and more um, arrays coming in online. Often we're up to 35% of our electricity coming from wind alone. Because I'll have, hold my hands up. I mean, when, when I, uh, I don't know, I, when, whenever I'm involved in the discourse around this, I, I would sometimes think, well, have we got enough electricity if we all went heat pumps? You know, that's something that uh, even people that really like heat pumps were, were sort of thinking about. But it turns out that we've... Um, Different ways of, of, of distributing electricity, you're not from one central point. We, it's, it's a survival option, isn't it? Re- renewables in the UK is snowballing, absolutely snowballing. And we are world leaders in, in what, we're, what we're doing and what we're producing. So I think, you know, we've already talked about we're already using less energy than we were 15 years ago on the, on the grid currently. And, we're pu- and we are leading in producing renewable energy. I can't really see, unless we all have a heat pump and an electric car delivered on our doorstep tomorrow, then that might be a challenge. But I think there's, it's like a two-horse race, and they're running in parallel, and they're snowballing in parallel. Um, so when, when the little kinks really do come to the crux, maybe in another 10, 15 years' time, where they might start seeing some bottlenecks in the grid and the electricity and everything else, they would have already been seeing that coming, and and planning for the future. Mm. But I I think, um, and from what data I've read, uh, there is no issues currently at the moment or foreseeable issues currently at the moment for the grid infrastructure. Well, I'm going to stop it right there. We're going to have a part two with Kenza, um, and I'll have the same guests. Um, I'd like to say thank you to my sponsor, which is MCS. You can look them up on the website at MCS Certified. Uh, If you like this podcast, you can follow it. And apparently, I've been told, you can also leave feedback or give it a five-star rating. Uh, So please do that, because I think it helps with search engines find it. So people that are wanting to sort of uh, learn about renewable technology or engage with the the, uh, conversations, uh, if you leave feedback on your podcast platforms, that helps search engines pick it up. And if you ever want to sort of get involved in the topics or you think there's some topics we haven't discussed, please contact me at learn at betateach.com. Dot co dot uk thank you very much <laughs>